I'm going to just note that um, Claudia has been someone that equitable growth has, um, whose research equitable growth has been really excited about since our founding. Um, uh, she actually spoke at our launch event that we did back in November of 2013. And it is just with great joy to be able to get to work with her every day and to allow her to share today her thoughts on what is happening with the economy with you all in ways that she couldn't do when she was uh, an actual inside government. So we're excited to be able to free her in that way today. So she's going to discuss research ideas that support a robust response to fight the coronavirus recession as well as um, longer term efforts to ensure a more resilient US economy in the years to come. She's gonna build on work um, that she did as a part of a book that we put out with the Hamilton Project a year ago this May. It's almost a year ago to the day, I believe it was the 16th, if, I'm, if my memory serves, um, called Recession Ready, where we brought together some of the um, most interesting scholars we could find to put together a handbook for what to do in a recession. Little did we know uh, how useful that would be just a year later. So a couple pieces of housekeeping before I allow Claudia to take the mic. Um, first, this whole conversation is being recorded, um, so it's all on the record. So tweet away, quote away, you know, whatever you want to do, that's totally fine, but don't say anything that you don't want um, other people to tweet or quote because <laughs> it's all on the record. Um, and then if you're going to tweet, please use the hashtag, um, hashtag EG lectures and hashtag EG presents in your posts. Um, we're going to allow Claudia to give her uh, remarks. We expect that she will talk for about a half an hour and then we will take questions. So we will not be interrupting her with questions and then I will be moderating um, those questions um, at, the, at the end. So if you have those, um, feel free to start um, stacking them up in the chat and we will um, go from there. So take it away, Claudia. Great. Thank you so much, Heather. And I, I really appreciate every single one of you who, you know, joined us today. Like Heather said, this is the first of our virtual series. And, uh, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be the one that gets to kick off the lecture series. I know this is the start of many really good conversations to join in. So yeah, I'm excited to be here. So I'm going to go ahead and like Heather said, I'm going to talk for a little bit and share with you my perspectives on what's happening right now and what policymakers need to do about it. I do want to make sure that we have lots of time for Heather and I to talk about, you know, have a conversation about it. And I do want to hear your questions. One of the things I learned after over a decade at the Federal Reserve is that I learn a lot from other people's questions. Right, so, and we'll see, hopefully, I got a lot of practice answering them, so hopefully I'll do a good job, but I do, like, that's how we, you know, it's in a conversation that we really learn something, because nobody's, nobody's got all the answers, and, you know, if I say something stupid, call me out on it. Okay, so I am going to go ahead and share my screen, hopefully, uh, get that into, come on, all right, there we go, technology, good job. Okay, so like I said, I'm going to focus on the coronavirus crisis. Now, I am an economist by training, so most of what I'm going to say focuses on what's happening to the financial situation of families and small businesses and municipalities. I absolutely want to stress before I get started that this is about a killer virus, first and foremost. And, you know, I, I listen to Dr. Fauci, the scientist, everybody on the front lines of public health to tell me what's happening in terms of staying safe and healthy. So I'm not gonna be that person. I'm going to tell you the things that I you know, feel like I have something to share. Okay, so uh, what are the questions? What am I gonna try and do today? And uh, many of you probably know that I spend probably more time than I should on Twitter, both econ Twitter and what's called FinTwit, which is financial Twitter. They have a sense of humor. Uh, and, uh, and I actually started, because I knew with you know 20 minutes, half an hour to talk, I have lots that I can say, lots that I'd want to say, but I wanted to make sure I was telling you all what, you want, what your questions were. 
So I had in the three pieces of this talk, I was like, okay, what do you want me to talk about? And this one really failed because I was like, should I talk about today or the coming months, or the coming years? And it was like really evenly split, split between the three. And then there were people who said, I don't care what you talk about. So I doubt they're here today. Um, anyway, so this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna touch briefly on what I see is happening today. Again, to underscore, we are living in a public health crisis. Like people are losing loved ones and it is absolutely tragic. On top of that tragedy, we have a very severe recession, something we have never seen for generations, and it's hurting a lot of people. We all know someone who has lost their job, whose income is down, and who's trying to figure out have some really tough problems about how do you make it, how do you make it work? Okay, so I will talk a little bit more in detail about that. And then it's important to think about, well, what comes next? So in the coming months, and again, I'm gonna keep hammering this home, what happens in the coming months really is about what happens in terms of our health and safety. I am listening again, and we've heard a lot more recently from public health experts, this isn't, this isn't gonna be one and done. Like this is gonna be a struggle. We're gonna to have to figure out what's safe and what's not. And we're probably gonna, we're gonna to have to adjust and be flexible. So far, Americans have done a pretty good job of adjusting, um, but there's more to come and we just have to pay attention to the experts in that space. Okay, so, but the economy is really tied right now. What families are living is really tied to what's happening out in the world with our health and safety. So I, I think that what we're gonna see over the coming months is gonna be a lot of one step forwards, two steps back. Hopefully we'll get to two steps forward and one back here soon. Um, but I, I also should say once we get past, well, I mean, frankly, I'm surprised practically every day by something else that's happened in the world, but especially when we get a few months out and oh my gosh, a couple years out, I have a lot of humility as a forecaster. Um, like I spent over a decade training how to read data, how to think about, um, what was wrong in our economy before bad things happened. And, um, but like, even I know, like, I can't, I can't do this. Nobody can, but it is absolutely important that we think about where we could go next because we can change it if we think hard about it and do something. Um, so I think the next couple of months are gonna be tough. I do not think that by July, we're gonna be back on track. I don't think by the end of the year, we're gonna be throwing a party. And um, turning to the coming years, I would love for it to be true, but I do not think next year is gonna be the best year the United States has ever seen. I hope I'm wrong. I will tell you all I'm wrong. I'll be so happy. But I really believe that we have to prepare for the worst. Policymakers have to prepare for the worst. The rest of us, we can hope for the best, but like that, that isn't gonna, that isn't gonna cut it. Um, so next year, what I am hopeful of, and I have a lot of faith in our health professionals. My mother works at a large hospital in Indianapolis. She works, she's a lab technologist. Uh, she runs blood tests every day and she knows how to do her job. Like she doesn't need anyone from DC to come in and tell her how to do her job. The women and men who work in the, the lab above her that are doing the test, the coronavirus test, they don't need DC to tell them how to do their jobs. They had to be a lot more careful doing their jobs. Anyways, but I think, you know, we're, they're gonna figure this out. We're gonna get to a place where the crisis is under control. And I think that's really by next year. And then we're gonna look around and the dust is gonna be settled and we're gonna have an absolute mess. Now, we've had absolute messes before and we will work hard at cleaning it up. I think there's a period next year that's really about cleaning up, assessing the damage, figuring out what we can do better, because there were a lot of problems in the economy that we're paying for now. But that's what we can do next year. We can kind of take a deep breath and jump right in. And then after that, then that's the recovery. Um, and, you know, we know how to do this, but if we don't do it and we don't, really do it then the long-term consequences are going to be they're going to be bad like we saw bad consequences from the great recession um there are young adults that came into the started looking for jobs at you know at the peak of the recession 
and um, they're still carrying around student debt that they're going to have a hard time paying off. They're still working jobs that aren't commensurate with their education. And it's going to be a while before they buy that house. So um, we know that was a problem. We know this recession is even more severe. So like we can't do that. Oh my God, we can't do it to the millennials again, this poor generation. Um, but it's not just going to be them. It's going to be all of us because this is like, this is really bad. Okay, so I'll get the last point about today. And then I do want to keep us moving, especially in like the more positive part of this talk. Um, so we have unemployment rates in the United States that are absolutely tragic. Um, I don't have to tell you all this, like you all know someone who's lost a job and um, someone who probably never thought they would lose their job, right? Uh, and so what we learned last Friday from the Bureau of Labor Statistics is the national unemployment rate was about 15%. Even our official statistical agency said they thought that was an underestimate by about five percentage points. Okay, so on top of that, we know since they ran their survey in the middle of April, like they always run in the middle of the month, we have had millions more workers file for jobless claims. So by my estimate, and I'm not the only one that crunches the numbers and finds this, we have unemployment above 20% right now. Like, wow. Um, and so what you see in this chart is like, we haven't seen that. We haven't seen these, the, um, the unemployment rate has been measured in a consistent way since 1948. And uh, yeah, we've just blown through everything that we've seen um, over that time. And frankly, the only thing comparable, and we actually don't have, like we can't do matchy matchy in terms of statistics, but the only thing that we're comparable to now is the Great Depression. February was 3.5% unemployment. It was like a 50 year low. And now we're like at a, yeah, it's really high. Okay, so that is what it is. Oops, wrong way. Um, we're not moving backwards here. Okay, so, but the silver lining in this and Heather talked about this with the recession ready volume that we, all worked on that we know what works and we know how to do it and even stepping back from the volume we put out last year like countless researchers economists sociologists like like there have been volumes and volumes written about what recessions do to us everything from the great depression to the great recession i mean like we could not stop reading there's so much stuff and with all of that decades of research and evidence, like people put a lot of thought into, okay, what do we do? Um, so that's good. We need research, we need to ground it in evidence. I mean, this is equitable growth thing is helping support researchers and make sure they do the best research they can. And in, in lectures like this, we make sure you all know about it. Cause like, you know, don't hide it. Congress needs it, the Fed needs it. Okay, um, so fast forward to last year, we did, we worked on this recession ready book. It was every single chapter had a researcher who had very, had like studied the program that they were talking about. They were all what fits under automatic stabilizers. And just a fancy way of saying these are all policies that kick on when the economy goes south. Like that's what they are. And, and they turn off when like people don't need it anymore. Okay, so the chapter I wrote was on sending money to people automatically in a recession. I um, started the Federal Reserve, my first forecast was in January of 2008. Uh, that first forecast was when it started moving in Congress that they were going to pass the 2008 rebates. So a Friday afternoon, our second forecast meeting, getting ready to close it up for the Federal Open Market Committee, and the news dropped and I spent a very long Friday night um, with the woman who was trying to train me, telling me to calm down. And we jammed this thing into the forecast. And that was based on like people before me had done this. Like we had assumptions about what that means, how consumers spend it, how much time it takes, how much it supports the economy. And the Fed needs to know all that because their monetary policy works around the edges. They don't want to get in the Fed's they don't want to get in Congress's way, but they want to make sure that people are supported. 
So that kicked off for me a research program with Matthew Shapiro and Joel Slamrod at the University of Michigan, who already were doing research in this space. And we have been working on it ever since. Next week, I'm going to get data from the surveys of consumers. We, feel, we have fielded, designed a survey about the 2020 rebates. So I'm not done. <laughs> Next time, I'll have more research to present. Um, but that was just me. There were chapters on the federal matching program for Medicaid, which is called FMAP. There were programs to enhance food stamps, infrastructure spending. Uh, I know I'm missing some. Like there were just, oh, unemployment insurance. That's a really important one. So every single chapter was super thoughtful researchers. They put together proposals. They absolutely made us like write numbers down and details because as Heather's talked about, it's really helpful on the Hill if you have a book to pull down in a crisis, and we should do it before a crisis, but if it doesn't get done and it didn't this time, then you got ideas and you just do it. Um, so that's been exciting. I've spent a lot of work talking with Hill staff and members since last November about how you would do this stuff. And again, I've learned a lot from them and their questions and we have like really refined the thinking and there are proposals moving on the Hill that like put automatic stabilizers in. That's really cool. Um, okay, so but all this said, we got tons of research, we got tons of evidence, we got great ideas. I help, um, as did, like many, many people, but it really don't matter. Like if policymakers don't apply them, then it really doesn't matter that there were lessons to be learned because they weren't learned. So it's about actions, it's about money, thoughts and prayers are important, but they're not going to get it done. So, um, one thing about the recovery I think is worth because there's a lot of discussion about V's and L's and square roots and I mean like what's going to happen again no one knows so take them all with a grain of salt uh, but what I think of and I've been thinking of the recession in this way for a while now is it's a natural disaster it actually fits pretty well I mean the coronavirus just came out of nowhere it like just it doesn't care who it kills um, and, and it's attacking the entire globe, right? Like we're not alone in this. So at the Federal Reserve um, with some colleagues, I developed a new, what we, I should say, it was like total group effort. Um, we developed a new way to measure retail sales and, you know, big data, lots of stuff we, we work through. But the thing that's special about it is it's daily and it's geographically specific, and we get it really fast. And so one of my last, um, one of my last rounds at the, on the staff's macro forecast, I was writing teal books, so that's the document that goes to the, the Federal Reserve officials before they decide on monetary policy. And we were giving them esti estimates of Hurricane Harvey and Hurricane Irma in real time using our data. And what we were able to show them is that retail spending just falls off a cliff when, um, when a hurricane bears down on an area. So what you can see here is Harvey, and this is, you know, we focus very much on the metro areas, like in the eye of the storm. And you can see Irma, and again, that was, you know, focused on Florida. All of our data is on the United States. We don't have good data for the territories, unfortunately. This is all, you know, the 50 states and District of Columbia. And what this shows you and is, well, how different was spending on those days? And this is actually national spending. Like we roll it up and aggregate it. How different was retail spending on the days around the landfall of the hurricane relative to what the world would have been without the hurricane? Um, there's a big drop, right? And if you actually look at it in terms of what was spending in those particular areas, I mean, with Irma, it basically went to zero, right? Because you had it just, you know, it's kind of similar right now because we're supposed to stay in our homes to, to be safe. When there's a hurricane bearing down, like you don't go out to Walmart, right? Like you stay at home. So, but the difference here is this are a category, the coronavirus is something like a category five hurricane that has sat on top of the United, the entire United States for two and a half, two months, right? Okay, so that's really bad. <laughs> so landfall is not a day, landfall is like months. And um, the other thing we learned, and we actually didn't know this as macro forecasters, but after the hurricane passes, 
you get back to like, you know, slowly we get up to where we would have been without it, but you don't see spending just like shoot off the charts. Economists refer to this as um, uh, pent up demand uh, and we don't see it. Like people go back to normal, but that hole, like it doesn't go away, right? Not, not quickly. So that's what I think about the recovery. Like we're gonna get there, but the damage that was done in the last two months, we can't undo. Um, unless we, you know, get the recovery really going, but that's not going to be this year, but we're going to work on it. Okay, so what do we do? Okay, everything that Congress and the Federal Reserve is doing right now is absolutely important, and it, like, it's about stopping the free fall, but honestly, the virus is going to stop the free fall when it just, like, we get it under control. What they're doing is really about helping us, helping families stand back up. So everything they're doing right now really is about the recovery and making sure that small businesses and families and municipalities get the other side of this without like mass bankruptcies and mass suffering. So that's what they're doing. Um, if they don't do it, the costs are really high. We knew from the Great Depression that like the damage lasted for a very long time. I mean, it makes the Great Recession's recovery look like a cakewalk, which it was not. Um, so they got to fight, they got to do everything they can. Um, I really do think if they don't, like we are barreling towards a depression and that's just like, we just can't do that. This is like, it's absolutely incomprehensible that one would even be using what we call the, the D word and <laughs> saying depression. Um, okay, but Congress can do this, right? They got to get relief out immediately. We saw yesterday on the Hill, um, the House representatives put out a $3 trillion package. I think that's like actually absolutely the bare minimum of dollars that need to go out. Um, yeah, but I'm not holding my breath. Uh, but that's what they should do. That's what we need them to do. And the other thing, and this goes back to the automatic stabilizers, is they could commit to continue this relief until we win, right? So, okay, so, but the, the devil's in the details. So how does Congress actually do this? So they passed legislation to continue the relief, okay? And the relief, and, and there's a lot of different kinds of relief. And again, this is my personal opinion, not like to represent equitable growth or Heather. I mean, like there's so many good ideas about out there about what relief is. I firmly believe we should keep it simple and keep it to the core. So keep those better jobless benefits coming, keep the higher food stamps coming, get the money to states, and keep doing that until people are back at work. Okay, so what this means is you don't pass relief, like what they've done right now, the last six months. Okay, so like the $600, it's gonna expire at the end of July. Don't do that. Don't pass it for six months, don't pass it for a year. You, you pass it until people don't need it anymore. Okay, the unemployment rate comes down. People are back at work and then you wind it down, right? Like we don't fight recessions forever. There are structural inequalities in the economy we should fight forever. But like this, this type of support is very specifically about fighting a recession, helping people in a recession. When, we've, when the recession's over, we can do something different. Okay, and the last point with this is you gotta keep it simple. This is not the Federal Reserve. We're talking about Congress. There is no regime switching factor model. We can't pull a hundred data series together and throw it into um, legislative text. I mean, frankly, I don't think they should do that at the Fed either, but, um, but you should use all tools. The best tools for Congress to use in terms of write, writing legislation is to keep it simple. The unemployment rate is the most transparent statistic we have. People, and it's really easy to understand. Like people don't have jobs. People want jobs, they don't have them. So keep all this relief coming until the unemployment rate is back down to 5%. And you do it no matter what it costs because um, we're worth it, but I don't want to like be Pollyannish, like, it cost, right? So um, the Joint Economic Committee put out a proposal about continuing the jobless benefits, enhanced jobless benefits. A big piece of that was what's called ex um, extended benefits. So it means if you become unemployed in a very bad labor market, you can keep getting those jobless benefits for a long time, like up to 65 weeks. Um, I mean, hopefully you'll get back to work before then, but if you don't, you're gonna be able to feed your kids and keep the lights on. So that's, that's really good. That's really expensive. Like I spent my mother's day 
kids are off with their dad, so it wasn't, don't feel sorry for me. I spent my Mother's Day wrangling with a spreadsheet to try and calculate what the Joint Economic Committee's um, enhanced benefits would cost. And it comes out about $2 trillion, right? And like a trillion of it is, um, it's the extended durations. So I think it's worth it. I think this should be like trillions and trillions of dollars. I'm not an elected official, I'm just there to crunch numbers. Um, but I do, I do worry if they, they don't do it. But you know, they pulled it out of the hat with the $2.2 trillion package. So I'm not, I'm not giving up, um, so we'll see. Okay, so that was what I wanted to share. And I know we've got a lot more to talk about, so I'll do a little more listening now. Great, um, wonderful. Thank you so much, Claudia. Um, that delay was that I was actually looking at the questions that people were asking, um, and I was I was wrapped up in that. So I'm excited to get to those. But um, as the moderator, I get to ask some first questions, and Claudia and I can have a little bit of a conversation here. Um, I mean, I want to thank you, Claudia, uh, just um, for all of us, uh, for all the work you've been doing to help people understand the crisis and to understand, you know, what kind of policy response and the scale and scope of um, the, the challenges in front of us. So um, you noted that you were working over Mother's Day. I know that's not the only uh, out of typical office hours you've been spending on this, but it, it's been great to, to have all of this, all of this data and research. Um, so I wanted to actually uh, pivot to something that happened, um, I believe today, or I learned about it today, but I think it happened today, um, where uh, Chairman Powell at the Federal Reserve um, did a press conference or a speech and talked about um, the recovery, the, re the relief efforts, and um, made the, the point that um, the Fed can't do everything and they need Congress to act. And really, I felt like you know, what I saw going over the internet about this was it was a real plea from the Fed saying, we, we don't have all the, the, we are not the only um, tool in your toolkit here. Uh, everybody else needs to do their part. Can you, uh, you know, tell me what you, if you, if you heard that or, um, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. what, what do you think about that? And, and I want to get to this question of what the difference is between the tools that the Fed has and Congress has and how we should think about um, that. Yes. So I did listen. So today Jay Powell was at the Peterson Institute talking with Adam Posen. And uh, yeah, I tuned in when he was at Brookings and talked to David Wessel and I was in tears by the end of it. Cause like I've watched a lot of press conferences recently and I was, oh, Powell is saying what I need to hear. <laughs> um, cause they're, the Fed is being real right now. And um, in a way that I, I, they didn't, in the Great Recession. I mean, they're a fundamentally um, risk averse institution. That's why I kind of didn't fit there, but they put up with me because I did good work. Um, but when, and I joke around on Twitter when he does these talks, and I did this morning, where I do this thing called Fed Speak Translation. So that's what they, they call when Fed officials talk, or frankly, staff talk, they do this thing called Fed Speak. And I mean, I wrote this stuff for 12 years, I know how to do it. Um, it's not how I tweet. Um, but I do this thing where I do Fed speak translation. And so I was listening to him talk. And I was listening to journalists put tweets out, you know, short clips of what he was saying. And there was one where he's talking about, um, I think it was Nick Timro said, uh, Chairman or Powell asked quietly in parentheses for Congress to do more. And I did the translation and I was like, like in all caps, Congress do something. Like, I mean, because that's, the Fed really doesn't want to get in the space of telling Congress what to do. And yet, and Powell mentioned this this morning, he is now in a long line of chairs, Bernanke and Yellen and himself, who have both publicly and pounding the pavement on the hills of Congress said, you have to do more. And it was really painful to watch Bernanke and Yellen uh, have to do this. The Fed, the Fed, um, the Fed could have done more after the Great Recession. The Fed is doing so much more right now. I'm so proud of them. Congress. One of the big lessons from the Great Recession that I'm not convinced that Congress has learned is that you cannot step away too soon. Like they stopped. They became really concerned about the deficit and bringing it down. When the unemployment rate was still a lot higher than we went into the Great Recession. And that was like massively damaging. The Fed knows that. And the Fed also knows 
that at this point, like, it's not what people need. Like, they don't need lower interest rates. They don't need loans. They need money. And right now, under the authority that the Federal Reserve has, it cannot send money. But Congress can do that. But they actually have to do it. And that's where Powell, without getting, I mean, he isn't going to like opine on like you got to pass automatic stabilizers and you need childcare and paid leave over jobless benefit. Like that, they're totally not going to get in their lane. I totally know that there are people back at the Fed that have like, you know, what's more effective and like, you know, um, like I probably wasn't the only macroeconomist spending the weekend trying to like cost out <laughs> some of these bills. I mean, that's what I know how to do. So, but I think, and we can talk more about how the two are different, but I definitely heard Powell loud and clear once again, and Fed officials are unanimous on this. They disagree about a lot of stuff about what's happening in the economy, but they are all in on like Congress has to do more. Well, I mean, it's really interesting because, um, you know, as you said, the Fed can't send money directly. Their tools really are about, um, in large part, about credit or the price of money, mm -hmm. you know, the, the interest rate. And, um, you know, one thing that, that I think it's important for everybody on the call to also remember is that, you know, typically in recessions, the Fed has lowered the interest rate by um, about uh, uh, five points. But when we started this recession, Claudia, what was the interest rate? Two was it two or was it 1.7? It wasn't getting very high. It wasn't even two. It was nothing. So there was no, there wasn't enough room, right, for the Fed to use its normal tools. So already we, we knew, which is part of why we wrote recession ready, we knew that we would be sitting here and people would look to the Fed and the Fed would already from out of the box have to use ex, what, what used to be considered these extraordinary mm -hmm. measures. Um, and so, you know, it does seem that there is this, um, I mean, so there is this issue with this particular crisis and the Fed saying, hey, you need to do more because of the magnitude of it. But there's also this long term issue of us really relying on the Fed and not taking as seriously the importance and the scope of fiscal policy in um, recessions, which we saw in the last recession as well, and which left us very unprepared, I would argue, for this one. Um, I wanted to kind of pivot from that to, um, you know, this question about, you know, so what else, you know, could we be doing and could the Fed be doing? So one thing that you wrote about um, in a recent op-ed in the New York Times was um, advocating for the Fed to lend more to municipalities, um, possibly without requiring them to pay that money back, which I thought was um, an interesting way of thinking about it, um, given that we know that because as you pointed out, unemployment is probably about 20%. Um, municipalities get about, I think, a third of their tax revenue from sales tax. Um, but then, the, or, you know, states and cities get their, or I think it's actually states, get about a third of their money from sales tax and people aren't spending, restaurants are, are shut and all the things, that their tax revenues are falling. And so they're going to be in a crunch right when the demand for the things that they do is rising. So tell me a little bit about uh, this idea and why you think this is necessary and why this is the right step for the Fed to do. So kind of riffing a little bit on the, what are the boundaries between the Congress, Congress and the Fed? All right, so the latest lending facilities that the Federal Reserve, and this was Congress in the, in the $2.2 trillion relief package, Congress gave the Federal Reserve the explicit authority and the money, like they backed it up, because I mean, not all loans come and get paid. Uh, they they told, Con or Congress told the Federal Reserve that they could begin lending facilities where they are now making loans to middle-sized businesses. So businesses that wouldn't be covered under the payroll protection program because they're too large, but they're not going to be in the lending facilities for big corporations, right? Because middle-sized companies need something different. So they call that the Main Street Lending Program. And the Federal Reserve also created a municipal lending facility. And they have, well, it's not up and running yet. Powell said this morning, these, these facilities are coming soon. Like they're working hard, but the Federal Reserve is not a place that rolls something out and then has to tear it all up and start over. Like they, this is just not how they work. Um, and there were, it's, it's coming, right? So, um, what was really important, and I was thrilled when this uh, was taking shape, was, the Federal Reserve in the Great Recession 
I mean, they actually pushed the authority they had absolutely to the limit and they kind of got some of it taken away. Um, but they went in really big to save Wall Street. The Federal Reserve, the most important thing they do, it's not about interest rates, it's about being the lender of last resort. That's why central banks exist, because when we didn't have them, it was, it was a real big mess. Um, so that's what they do. And that's like, they have an alphabet soup of lending facilities now, and, and they did in the Great Recession, all of them, in the Great Recession were pointed at Wall Street or big players, big corporations. They never got to the point where they started lending to Main Street. There are a lot of reasons for that. We don't have to get into the politics of the Fed and Congress, uh, but they didn't take that step and that was, that was bad, right? So not only did Congress step away, the Federal Reserve didn't like put the pedal to the metal and go straight for Wall Street. This time they are, it's very exciting. They haven't run these facilities before, so it, it's harder for them to stand those up. I mean, they were backstopping the treasury market like two days after it was getting really wobbly. Um, so they're trying to do this. It, um, I argue that once the Federal Reserve starts to backstop, backstop Main Street, even with Congress's authority, they have stepped into a territory that is fundamentally risky for the Fed because they're going to have to start picking winners and losers. And, and it's really like we get it, right? And you've, I've seen countless news articles about the Fed is going to lend to the wrong companies. Now, and we can have a real discussion about whether mid-sized oil companies should get the money or if it should go to the retailers and, oh, should construction have it? They're still working. Like, there's a very legitimate debate to have about that. But, oh, my gosh, that's a debate that once the Fed gets in the crosshairs, I mean, they're going to get blamed for all this anyways, but, like, they don't need, like, more people really understanding what they're doing. Um, the Fed likes to kind of fly under the radar, but like when there's small businesses or that like, we really need the money and you didn't give it to us, like that's a problem. And the same thing we see with the municipalities. Um, it's a hard market for the Fed to get into because there's not as much like loans happening. And so they really do have to pick winners and losers. I argue that the buyers pick the losers so they know who to go help. But the problem is the, they put restrictions on how large the cities they could lend to are. And frankly, even when they expanded it, they're still missing cities like New Orleans that were absolutely crushed. And many cities that have lots of, you know, communities of color and people who are really at the epicenter of this crisis, and they're too small to get the money. Like their states can all get the money, but then you got to count on the states to get the money to the communities. Anyway, so it's really tough and they're all loans. And frankly, a lot of these municipalities have such a huge hole in their budget that there is no guarantee they're going to be able to pay it back in two years, right? And the same thing for the small business or the Main Street Lending Program, it's risky. Like if you take out a loan, you're on the hook for it and you might not be able to pay it back. So maybe it'll like smooth out all the people you have to fire, but like you're still going to have to fire people and you're going to have to cut essential services. So that's bad. And like to your point about the little wonky Easter egg that I stuck in at the end of it, if the Fed had more authority, and Chairman Powell has said more than once that the Fed will use the authority it has, it only has lending authority. And it actually, it has to lend to people who, or entities that you think are gonna make it. Yeah. Like they can't buy junk. They can't like give money to a corporation that is teetering on bankruptcy. That the Congress could tell them they could do that, and that might be the next step. But again, that's really risky because you're just you pouring uh, what they call good money after bad, right? Yeah. Um, anyway, so but the Fed, if it had different authority, I mean, there's a, a meme going around like uh, the printing press go brewer. I mean, the Fed, <laughs> like, if they told them you can just you can essentially send money out, it's the same thing of like you make loans, but you tell the people you're never going to have to pay this back. And we're not going to pay it back. We're just going to put it on the balance sheet. People look at the federal debt and they're like, oh, look at how much it is. Nobody look. I mean, I look and I know some like journalists who watch like when the statement comes out and what's on the balance sheet and it's big. But like nobody cared about that. Nobody cared in the Great Recession. Nobody cares now that they didn't run it down. I mean, Fed people care, but like normal people don't care. Um, even normal people in Congress don't care. And so that could be a way... I'm, I'm really concerned that there's already discussions about how big the deficit spending is. Yeah. It's going to get bigger. And while I do not want the Fed to have this authority, it's, I mean, it's basically undemocratic to have unelected officials putting that much money on. But if that's what we got to do, then 
Yeah. Well, so you, you've actually, um, you've gotten it. I was looking at the questions and you got it a question um, that Yair Listikin asked, I believe about, <laughs> yeah, about what the Fed should do. And I want to just rip on that. Uh, another question here that I see from, um, that kind of gets at what you just got at about deficits, um, where Yair had, had asked whether or not, just so the audience knows, um, he had asked whether or not the Fed should just send $1,200 checks to every American if Congress doesn't do it. And you've noted they don't have the authority to do so. And, and you've also noted that there are real questions about the accountability vis-a-vis um, -vis the Fed and the Fed's mandate. The Fed is um, designed to ensure financial stability. It's supposed to ensure full employment and price stability. That's its mandate. And we're adding things to it. And I think this does bring up a real deep question for our country about both how we deal with crises, but how what is the proper role for mm -hmm. the fiscal authority that's supposed to be spending taxpayer dollars and this agency, which is super, super important, but is not empowered to do all the things because it's not accountable to Congress. So that's a big question. I'm going to set that aside for a moment because yeah. that's okay. also, we also need, I think, some constitutional scholars to help yeah. us engage in this question. So let's just, as economists, we're uncovering a problem. You all um, go with that. Um, you all constitutional scholars. But I want to go to Bradley Hardy's question. Um, and he asks, uh, what is you know, it uh, could be on the face of it seen as a very simple question. Um, you know, when you're thinking about the deficits, uh, many of us like, and you've sort of said this, well, we can't afford not to act, right? You talked about the long-term scarring of young people from the Great Recession. And he asked, um, you know, we as economists understand opportunity costs and we can kind of lay them all out, but is there like a back of the envelope calculation? Is there like a number that people can use if they want to call um, their member of Congress and talk to them about the policy response? Somebody else asked about, you know, you know, how we can do that. But what is there a um, uh, some sort of number that people could use? What would you, how would you empower folks with that? Or do you have an answer? So I would call up your member of Congress <laughs> and just say 30% unemployment. What are you gonna do? Like, I don't, and, and I, I don't think next month when the numbers come out, we're going to have 30%. I think we're going to be close to 25%. And like, that's this month, like what we are living right now. I do think that it's entirely possible this summer that we'll have 30%. I just, if members of Congress do not do something when we are hitting 30% or we're getting anywhere near it, it, I mean, it is an absolute dereliction of duty. Like, I don't care who you voted for, nobody voted for this, right? Like, so, um, yeah, and I have, like, lots of words <laughs> to say about the deficit, but I do think in, I try to be very open-minded, and I try and listen to as many people, and to your point about, like, okay, what are the tools you give someone to have a conversation to say, I disagree with you, but I want to, like, ground it in something other than I'm yelling in your face, <laughs> which I might do sometimes, um, but, like, you know, the Congress, they are elected officials, they are stewards of our economy. Those, at the end of the day, it's the US taxpayers that are on the line for the treasuries, the lending that the federal government does. I mean, the treasury is the piggy bank, but it's like, it's kind of all of our piggy banks, right? And yeah. not just now, but like for generations, right? So there is a big discussion about if we hand off to our children and our children's children, a huge price tag, that they are like crushed by debt. The federal government has to spend billions and billions of dollars servicing that debt, like paying it back and just paying the interest back. This is bad, right? And this is the, the thing that gets talked about and is being talked about right now by some members of Congress. The thing is, is that conversation, and Chairman Powell said this today too, that conversation we should have in the best of times. Like we should have been having it like three or four years ago. We had a different conversation, but like it is what it is. So when the economy is really strong, when employment is very high, then that's when, that's when we can save up, we can pay back some of that debt. In a recession, just like we don't expect families right now to be paying their mortgages down. Like, <laughs> this is ridiculous. So the idea that Congress should be doing that right now, paying off the debt or not taking on debt. I mean, small businesses, we are asking small businesses to go out and take loans so that they get through to the other side of it. Well, come on, Congress. Like, they're, Congress is the only entity in the country that doesn't have to balance its budget, like, you know, month by month, year by year. So, like, now in a recession, this is when you spend. 
And I've heard my members of Congress say a couple of things. One, let's wait and see what happens. And I'm like, oh, sir, I don't think that's a good idea. Um, and this again, when they see 30%, I feel like something has to give. And then I also saw someone talking about, well, how are we gonna pay for this? And I'm like, well, it's called deficit spending. Like you don't, because, and to me, it's like, if you don't do this, if you don't help when we have one in five, one in three in 10 American workers out of work, if you don't help them, you have a big problem on your hands and then we will pay for it because the absolute best way to pay down our debt is not to raise taxes. Nobody wants to pay more in taxes. Some so, people should uh, pay more in taxes, but should. then the yeah. economy gets better, like the tax revenue comes in and then you pay it off. So. Well, so let me tie in a couple of questions on that because I think that is so, that's, it's such an important question. And I mean, you know, one of the things that, um, one of the people on uh, the questioners asked, Dion um, Raboon from Axios asked, um, you know, that despite the fact that we, that the Fed has taken these steps so far, um, most Americans still don't have a favorable, favorable view of these particular steps. Um, and, you know, the, this, this part of what made me think that this is a nice, um, what you said is a nice transition into this question, and I want to get in another question because I think there's a nice transition there too, is that um, the, the question also asked, you know, do you worry that Congress will turn on the Fed after this crisis has passed, right? Yeah, I mean, you sort of noted earlier, the Fed's gonna get all the blame. People don't really like these kinds of bailouts. They actually would prefer some of the spending, which, which bucks right up against the argument you were just making about deficits that I think surveys show that most Americans would prefer to get the unemployment rate down from you know, 20%. And they're not, they're not walking around every day thinking about deficits. They're thinking about how they're gonna make their own household budget. Um, and so there is this really interesting dialogue that we have here in Washington about deficits um, and giving all this authority to the Fed, which doesn't seem consistent with what some of the polling and what people want. And so the questioner, I think, was asking, you know, um, will Congress, uh, will, will this affect, you know, um, uh, the popularity of Congress or the Fed afterwards? And I can't weave in another question into that because that was too much. So, but there's a few more <laughs> questions I want to get to. So um, we're yeah. going to try to- I'll be yeah. brief with that one. So the Federal Reserve is always blamed. Like, I mean, <laughs> from, I mean it really is. There's like research and books on this. Um, but what's really sad is right now we see like everybody trying to point a finger at everybody else. And this yeah. happened after the Great Recession too. And frankly, there's like so much blame to go around that none of us should be pointing fingers and we should just be like, you know, holding hands and figuring out how to do it. I do think the Federal Reserve, and they know what they have walked into. I mean, again, there was a very explicit decision not to save Wall Street. I mean, they did, they felt they were doing it indirectly by keeping financial markets going, but to actually go in and start lending to businesses and municipalities, they knew that was pushing past what people were gonna accept and and this is, I argue in my piece that like, they put their toe in the water and they got to jump in now because the Fed either pulls this off with, hopefully with Congress's help, but if they don't, I mean, the end of Fed pressure was so intense after the Great Recession that like this time, I mean, that's going to look like nothing, right? But the Federal Reserve stepped up and they said, you know, the American people are worth more than our institution. And that's what they should do. It's very scary because yeah. they really do need a lender of last resort. But yeah, I mean, but the thing is, like, Chairman Powell can take it. I mean, he was compared to a dictator, you know, a couple of years ago. Like, <laughs> it's okay. What happened? I mean, we shouldn't do that. But like, they, the, the institution, and like, like, they get that. That's happened for a long time. So, so um, switching gears a little bit. Thank you, Claudia. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit. Um, and there's a question from Asha Banerjee about, you know, how we should think about recovery packages. So we know that the House just released today their new um, HEROES, uh, I believe the acronym is HEROES, for the new legislation that they've got out, although across my Twitter feed, people are talking about SHEROES, so <laughs> I'm not sure, like, I'm not sure what the real name is, but I guess um, <laughs> anyway, there wasn't enough money for child care, for, so maybe it's not SHEROES. Anyway, I digress. Um, <laughs> but, the, but Asha asks, um, 
you know, as we're sort of thinking about this new package, how much of the fiscal side should be um, focused on, and a number of the questioners kind of ask on the right balance between policies to help workers and families versus policies to help businesses is one question. And then another question is, how much should we be thinking about vulnerability? Um, how much should we be sort of thinking about the fact that, that COVID-19 is hit so hard in black communities all across the country, especially, but communities of color, um, and that we know that the job losses um, have hit um, everyone hard, but we know especially that the folks that are left in those essential jobs have been disproportionately workers of color and women. So how do we think about both targeting to the most in need, and universality. So there's sort of two questions here. One is about sort of mm -hmm. the people, and then one is about the composition between people versus firms. Although I will note people make up firms, so it's not really a fair yeah. way of saying it. But so can you kind of get at those two levels as we think about fiscal? Yeah, so let me tar start with people. And I agree with you, people and small businesses, just all businesses and communities. So just like think of them all as a whole. And we know like they're not all the same, right? right. And, and they don't all need the same thing. From, from us, from DC. So I think this is one where there's a lesson from the Great Recession that's kind of like, whatever you think you need to do, double it. And like I said, I think this at this point is three times as worse. So I want you to take, if you think you need to do a trillion, do three trillion. And the thing is, is who that helps most are the people who need it most. Like if you take a trillion and you spread it out among everybody, then that means the people who really needed it most, the communities of color, the people with less education, the people that live out in the middle of nowhere with no like internet service, like they're gonna get missed because you can't just spread it around. You've got to like really go in and help the people who need it most. I think you should help everybody. Like I like the rebates because like everybody gets something. Then you don't have to get grumpy that so-and-so got more. You just think, hey, you got your check, chill. Yeah. Um, and go spend it um, or pay down debt, whatever you need to do. Um, but so I think that's to me important. That's one of the reasons going big is good because then you really hit, help the people that are hit hardest and you don't have to fight over the money. Now, in terms of what the composition should be, and I'll frame it up a little differently because I really do think yeah. we should be helping everybody. But some of the conversations I've been in are like, okay, what do we do now? And what do we do next year? Mm -hmm. Right? So like I said, I still think we are in this like, uh kill the virus and just like help the like stop the free fall right and, and because the virus is so intertwined with what's going on we should think creatively about like okay there's a bunch of people out of work should we hire a bunch of contact tracers like lots of them this seems like a good idea right there's people yeah. on the we have this health crisis so like put them to work like census knows how to hire people we do it like this is a census year just get them get them yeah. on the payroll um, the federal payroll don't ask states to do this like they have no money for this anyway so like i think it's things like that but continuing that analogy is well next year there's still going to be a lot of people unemployed and after the great depression we had a jobs program right and they went out and they they built bridges and dams and national parks and i you know we can do that for the 2021 right? Go, instead of rural electrification, let's go do rural broadband. And let's build a whole bunch of windmills. Well, like, let's get safe drinking water. water. Safe drinking yeah, drink, water. Yeah, so, and like go into the, the, the border communities that don't have running water and go like make those Native American reservations something that we should be proud of, right? So like there's so many things that the government could do. There's going to be people who need jobs. And that's a way like for many many americans work is a part of their identity earning a paycheck that will actually feed their families is like tied up in dignity and like there's a lot of people that didn't have that going into this that were balancing like an impossible task that shouldn't happen again but there's gonna be a lot of people a lot more people who are faced with that and oh my gosh let's get them jobs let's retrain them into sectors like by on the job, retrain them into sectors that have something we need going forward. And then like we all win, right? But there's a lot of false choices. And again, the deficit, you know, to keep hammering at home, that's a false choice. Like do we spend on people or do we pay our debt off? So. Yeah, um, so yes, I mean, those are the, it is a false choice. Um, 
And so we have a bunch of really fantastic questions. We also have only have three minutes. So I'm going to just touch on one thing that I see here, and then I'm going to ask you a question, Diane. Um, uh, Prakash Langani um, from the IMS asked about whether or not you're, con you should, you're concerned about overly optimistic forecasts of recovery from the Fed and whether or not that will lead to premature withdrawal of stimulus. I'm going to go out on a limb and suggest that your answer is yes to that. I mean, yes, in that sense that as people are saying it's not big enough, that people aren't thinking big enough. That's what I can yeah, But the Fed is not stepping away. Like in no, the Fed is not stepping away. Too. I think the question was whether or not the, um, the estimates of how bad things are are going to lead people to premature um, withdrawal. And I think you're, basic, you're, you're saying yes to that, yeah? Well, I think, and this is the unfortunate thing about the Fed can't share their forecasts mm. um, because they're grim. Like uh, Quarles, who's also on the Board of Governors, talked yesterday and he's like, every time the staff comes back with a forecast, it's worse. And I'm like, yeah. yes, sir, it is. Um, and I think in this morning, one of the really encouraging things that Powell said, and I think this is important for everyone who's really thought about getting people back to work, is he basically said full employment is a concept and the Federal Reserve has really struggled with like how to define that and how to live up to that part of its mandate. He said, we're just setting that thing aside. We have no idea what it actually means to be full employment. So we are just going to let it rip until people are back to work. And I mean, he said it in a very Fed speaky way. This is again my translation, um, but it was huge. And people were really reacting to that because that was a big mistake the Fed made. The Fed has had an introspection. They talked to low moderate income communities and advocates and they get it. Like they messed that up. This is not about a lesson they need to apply right now. It's a lesson they're gonna need to apply in six years. And it really was comforting to hear that like they learned that now. I have absolutely no faith that there are other parts of the government and the economy that have figured that out. And there are like dangerously optimistic forecasts coming out. Right. Of, and that's, that's bad. And it actually lies to people. Like it's not going to be that easy. So, but you know, maybe they're right. I hope they're right. They're wrong, but whatever. So I'm going to, I'm going to end on that note that they're wrong. Um, and I'm not going to end on the whatever. I mean, I think that, you know, one of the things that, um, just to, you know, a couple of closing remarks here, um, you know, one of the things that I am really taking from your comments, um, Claudia, is that we need to do everything we can now. The long-term effects on our economy and our society are dire if we do not. Um, we need to be prepared for this to be really bad. Um, and in no small part, because we, don't, we haven't, as you put it, killed the virus. Um, and as you started your, your comments, I mean, all of this comes down to the fact that until, and to use your analogy of the hurricane, the hurricane is still swirling around us, right? We're still, we are still literally in the hurricane so long as this virus is, is yeah. making it impossible for humans to congregate in the way that we normally do. Um, I read a number of very disturbing studies yesterday from um, other countries about, you know, that people sitting around together, talking, singing, laughing, these are the ways that you transmit the virus. And it was, it was so sad, but yet so long as that's true, um, that has huge economic effects um, and effects on our society. So you're, I think you're right to start there and to sort of say this, this economic crisis is very real. We need to do everything we can um, to keep it going. But I also think you've really elevated some big questions about what is the proper role of the Fed? Um, how do we think about the tools that they have? How can we encourage Congress to do the right thing and think about things like stabilizers? And I hope you've given everybody on this call a lot to think about. I know that you give me a lot to think about every day. Um, so with that, I'm going to close down this first in our lecture series. Um, thanks to everybody who submitted a question. I'm sure I didn't get to them all. There's some amazing people that have asked questions. Um, well, I'll give you them an audience. Answer them. Okay, great. We'll, we'll make sure that you get those. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and um, uh, look forward. I hope you all look forward to the next time uh, that we join you and do this. So thank you all and signing off. Yeah, thank you.